Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Ethics in Research and Biotechnology series sponsored by the Center for Bioethics at Harvard Medical School. This is a monthly seminar series that explores issues at the intersection of ethics, technology, and bioscience, all with an eye to our practical approaches and policies and ethical responsibilities. I'm your host, In Siu Hyun. I'm Director of Research Ethics and Senior Lecturer at Harvard Medical School Center for Bioethics, and I'm Professor of Bioethics and Philosophy in the Department of Bioethics at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. Now, if you're new to this series, I do have a few um, points to make about logistics. So first of all, thank you so much for joining us online. This event is being recorded and it's being live streamed via Facebook. The event video will later be posted on the Center for Bioethics Facebook page and on YouTube pages if you want to return to this later. You can submit questions at any time during our discussion by using the Q&A function. Don't use the chat function, use the Q&A function for your questions. And we'll try to get to as many of those as we can at the end of our presentation. Um, if you have any technical issues that come up, then you can use the chat feature to send a message to the panelists and staff that might try to help you with that, okay? Uh, if you have any interest in upcoming events, you can visit the website for the Center for Bioethics. And with that now, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. Our um, co-presenter is Hiromitsu Hiro Nagauchi. He's professor in the Department of Genetics at Stanford's Institute for Stem Cell Biology and Regenerative Medicine. He's professor of stem cell therapy in the Institute of Medical Science at the University of Tokyo. He is a renowned expert in hematopoietic stem cells and in the topics that we will cover today. I do wanna make a few disclosures before we get started. First is that the International Society for Stem Cell Research is revising the guidelines for stem cell research, including Chimera research. And I'm the chair of the Chimera Research uh, Committee and Dr. Uh, Naguchi is also a member of that committee. Uh, I'm also the co-PI on an NIH-funded project looking at the ethics of uh, human-animal chimera research in collaboration with scholars at the Hastings Center. So what I express today uh, are not views that necessarily correspond to those of my colleagues. Uh, one more alert for our viewers. Um, there are slides uh, with pictures of animals uh, that you might pretty much expect to see in a scientific publication a little bit of dissection, some organs. Um, so I just wanted to give a little warning about that. Uh, again, nothing you would uh, not see in a scientific publication, but there are uh, some images of rodents. Um, so with that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Nagauchi Hiro. Um, the uh, topic for today is growing transplantable human organs and livestock. So I'd like to turn it over now and please take us through uh, some of your work. I hope you can see my slides. Yes. Okay. Good. Thank you, Insu, for your introduction. And good morning, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Hiro Nakauchi, and uh, I've been working on uh, organogenesis uh, project. And that's what uh, I'm going to talk about from now. So uh, I have two laboratories, one in the University of Tokyo, Tokyo, Japan, and another in uh, Stanford University. Uh, these two laboratories are working uh, together uh, cooperatively, trying to uh, translate uh, discoveries of basic uh, you know, sciences into the clinic. Uh, and I will tell you why I have two laboratories later in my talk. And uh, <clears throat> in vivo, uh, organ generation project is, is the one I started as a sort of a side project uh, about 12 years ago. And as uh, Insu introduced, my major field of research is uh, hematopoietic stem cells. So I would like to start with a little bit of background. As you know, organ transplantation is the only uh, cure for those with end stage uh, organ transplantation. Uh, because, uh, however, uh, because of the shortage of uh, donor organs, a uh, number of uh, patients waiting, on the, uh, when waiting for the transplantation is increasing, as you can see here. In the United States alone, uh, 20 patients die each day waiting for a transplant. 
And because of this absolute lack of donor organs, there's even a black market selling organs. And uh, this is not a minor you know, business. Actually, more than 10,000 organs were sold in 2010. Uh, so this is a wild, worldwide ethical issue, I think. So this is uh, the current situation for organ transplantation. And as you can see, these people must have donated, I mean, sold <laughs> one of their kidneys because we can see this, uh, you know, operation scar here. So uh, <clears throat> although this is the only cure uh, for the uh, end stage organ failure, uh, but there are several issues here. The biggest issue is, of course, as I mentioned, a shortage of donor organs. There's even uh, there's a illegal organ trafficking, and also immunological rejection is another issue because organ transplantation is usually from somebody else. So uh, we have to give patients uh, immunosuppressant uh, throughout uh, life after transplantation. Uh, but these two issues could be uh, solved if we can generate uh, transplantable organs from patients' own stem cells. Uh, then there should be no uh, immunological issues involved. Uh, as you know, now we have iPS cells in addition to ES cells. So iPS cells can be generated from the patient. So we should be able to provide the patient's own cells organs, tissues. However, a current uh, therapy uh, uh, targeting, uh, you know, uh, diseases that can be treated by cell uh, therapy. But, you know, with a cell therapy, you cannot help people with end stage kidney failure or liver failure and so on. So we need to, we need organs, not just cells. But obviously, it's not easy to generate organs in, in a, you know, a culture dish because it has a 3D structure and uh, it has many different uh, cell types uh, involved in, in, the, in the organ. So uh, uh, my idea is to use uh, in vivo environment uh, to grow human organs because it should have everything, you know, every environment necessary to grow organs. But of course, we cannot do this in human. So we are thinking of uh, making uh, human animal chimeras, particularly livestock animals, to grow human organs from uh, iPS cells uh, obtained from derived from the patient. Then uh, we can solve these issues: shortage of donor organs and immunological rejections. So uh, <clears throat> I think. You know the audience you know about the ips technology but let me explain a little bit about chimeras a chimera is not a monster it's an animal that has two or more uh, different populations of genetically distinct cells uh, the important thing is the chimera is uh, not a uh, genetic mixture uh, but just a mixture of cells so we didn't touch we do not touch genes and chimeras cannot expand as chimeras. They only have uh, you know, two different uh, germ cells, but never a hybrid uh, mixture. So the easiest uh, example is parcel chimera. For example, a patient after blood transfusion or bone marrow transplantation, organ transplantation, they have uh, you know, uh, the, somebody else's cells uh, inside the body. So they are chimeras. A number of examples for, for partial chimeras. But what I'm talking uh, about, what I'm, what I'm going to talk about is a little different. It's a systemic chimera. When two very early embryos are aggregated or mixed together uh, very early in development, uh, because both of them have a capability to differentiate, to become into different cell types, uh, that chimera uh, uh, has two types of cells. Uh, in all tissues and organs. Uh, this is one example. Uh, this is rat mouse chimera uh, from the left. It's a wild type mouse. And uh, right mouse is the uh, wild type rat. And these two in the middle 
uh, rat to mouse or mouse to rat chimeras. So it, it is obvious just by the coat color that they are a mixture of cells. So these are the chimeras that I'm going to talk about. Uh, I guess there's no need to talk about iPS cells. So uh, I just tell you how we can, how we make chimeras. Uh, we, for example, if we want to make mouse to rat chimeras, we prepare mouse pluripotent stem cells. It could be iPS cells or ES cells. We also prepare uh, uh, blast, uh, early embryos from rats. Uh, blast, we call it blast, blast cyst stage embryo, uh, which is about three to four days after our conception. So this uh, rat blast is a small cavity. Uh, this is still a you know, cluster of uh, maybe a hundred cells. Uh, and this portion uh, is, uh, becomes the, uh, the body. And the other part uh, you know, will become a placenta. So anyway, we inject mouse uh, iPS cells into the uh, cavity of this blast cyst. And then uh, uh, this is how we do it. Uh, this is a blast, rat blast cyst, and we are injecting mouse uh, pluripotent stem cells through this tiny uh, you know, uh, pipette. And you can see these uh, cells being injected. And 20, 24 hours later, uh, if we mark the uh, injected uh, PS prepotent stem cells with red, then you can see mixture of uh, red and also host cells. Then we transfer this chimeric embryo to a foster mother. And an important thing is uh, the host foster mother and host uh, blast cyst has to be the same uh, species. Otherwise, they cannot uh, accept uh, and maintain pregnancy. So in this case, we used rat uh, foster mother. And then three weeks later, we see birth of uh, uh, chimeras and they, um, many of them grow uh, into adult and they look like this, it's a mouse to rat chimeras. So this is how we make uh, interspecies uh, chimeras. So now you know iPS cell technology and also, uh, you know, how to make chimeras. So our future goal is this, we're trying to generate human organs in livestock animals. Suppose this is a patient with end stage heart failure. And then we generate iPS cells from this patient and we inject them into the blast cyst of our, our livestock animals. But you know, uh, one uh, you know, idea that we, we made is the, uh, we use organogenesis disabled uh, animals. In this case, for example, uh, we can make a pig that cannot form a heart uh, so that when they make, we make a chimera, if they, we can make a chimera, uh, this pig, chimeric pig should have human cells everywhere, but in a heart uh, because a host pig cannot make a heart, the heart should be all derived from uh, you know, patients' iPS cells. So once the heart is uh, you know, become appropriate size, then we can take this heart out and transplant back to this patient. Although this heart was generated, uh, formed in, in a pig environment, the cells are all from uh, patients' own iPS cell, cell derived. So uh, you know, essentially this transplantation should be uh, autologous uh, transplantation and should not require any uh, lifelong uh, immunosuppression of the patient's own heart. So this is the idea. And uh, this, just, this whole idea is uh, called uh, blast cyst organ complementation. So uh, we, this sounds like a scientific, uh, you know, science fiction like story, but we have uh, a lot of uh, 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 proof of concept data using rodents. Uh, our first experiment was to use a uh, kidney deficient mouse. We knocked out SAL1 gene. Uh, so these mice cannot make uh, kidneys and they die soon after birth. So here, uh, I thought you know, that the space niche for kidneys is open. So if we make chimera by injecting uh, wild type pluripotent stem cells, like ES cells or iPS cells, these cells can 
form kidneys. They are normal uh, pluripotent stem cells. So if we make a chimera, the cells derived from uh, normal uh, pluripotent stem cells should use this space and develop uh, uh, kidneys. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, these kidneys uh, should be made of uh, cells only derived from injected iPS cells. So this is what uh, I initially uh, thought. And when actually performed this experiment, it worked. So this is a Salva knockout mass, no kidneys. But once, uh, in this case, GFP marked iPS cells were injected into the blast cyst, and uh, two, three weeks later, uh, when we looked at the embryo or neonates, we could see a generation of uh, kidneys like this, and bladder was inflated by urine, indicating that these kidneys are functional. And under the you know, fluorescent microscope, uh, you can see it's a systemic chimera. So we see some uh, fluorescence in, in everywhere, but you know, if you look at kidneys, they're very, very bright for GFP indicating that most of the cells, uh, as we expected, are derived from injected uh, iPS cells. So this is our first uh, demonstration of uh, you know, proof of concept of this idea. And this is not just for kidneys. We tried a number of other organs like pancreas, thymus, kidneys, liver, vessels, blood, and uh, more recently, brain, lungs, parathyroid gland and, and germ cells as well. So it works at least in mouse to mouse chimeras. But as you know, we cannot use human to make our uh, organs. So we have to eventually use uh, animals. So it's, it's gonna be a, a xenogenic interspecies uh, blastist complementation. So we try to obtain a proof of concept that we can make organs in xenogenic or uh, other, you know, uh, uh, species uh, environment. So we try to test this using mouse and rat. Uh, they're both uh, rodents, but uh, different species. Uh, rat is 10 times bigger than mouse. They have different number of chromosomes, so many uh, differences between the two. So we generated rat ES cells, rat IPS cells, and uh, we performed uh, experiments like this. So here, uh, we try to generate uh, uh, rat pancreas in mouse. It sounds like a crazy idea, but uh, we try to see whether you know, mouse can generate rat uh, pancreas in this case. So we used PDX1 gene knockout mouse. Uh, PDX1 is uh, necessary for the development of pancreas. So these mice cannot form pancreas and they die soon after birth. Uh, because of the pancreatic insufficiency. So we injected wild type, normal rat iPS cells into the PDX and knockout mouse embryo. And as we expected, we were able to generate mouse rat uh, uh, chimeras. And we were able to see rat pancreas uh, in these chimeras and because these mice could survive and grew, grow into uh, adult food. It means that these pancreas, rat pancreas, must be uh, functioning uh, right in, in mouse environment. Uh, however, interestingly, as I mentioned, you know, in this case, we have to use mouse as a, a mouse surrogate mother. The size was chimera. Size uh, of the chimera was a mouse size, and so was the uh, rat pancreas. So, although cells were from rat uh, cells. The pancreas was mouse sized, very interesting. Now, unfortunately, this uh, mouse sized uh, rat pancreas was too small to transplant back to rat. As I said, uh, rat is 10 times bigger than mouse. So uh, we were not able to uh, uh, prove that this pancreas could be transplanted uh, without any uh, rejection. So we tried the opposite experiment now we try to generate uh, mouse pancreas in rats. So we did uh, exactly the reverse experiment. We generated PDX and knockout rat, and we injected uh, normal uh, wild-type mouse iPS cells. And as you can see now, uh, expect uh, the we as we expected, we could see uh, rat-sized uh, rat-to-mouse chimeras. 
and we're able to find uh, mouse pancreas, this huge uh, chimera. Uh, but this time, uh, rat sized mouse pancreas was too, obviously, too large, too big to transplant back to mouse. So this is the, uh, the size of the mouse, mouse pancreas generated in rat. This is the normal uh, mouse pancreas. This is uh, wild type normal uh, rat pancreas. So you can see how big this mouse pancreas is. Uh, this is too big to transplant as a whole organ. But as you know, we do uh, islet cell transplantation for uh, type 1 diabetes patients. Islet is a you know, cluster of cells in the pancreas uh, composed of uh, uh, you know, beta cells or other cell types that produce uh, various hormones. And most importantly, insulin uh, produced by beta cells. So people isolate islets and transplant to the diabetic patients. So we sort of mimic that uh, uh, you know, therapy. So we prepared islets from uh, this uh, mouse pancreas generated in rats and transplanted 100 islets, only 100 islets per mouse to the drug induced uh, mice to see if whether they are rejected or not rejected, or if they are able to you know, uh, normalize or treat uh, diabetes. So we, these are the two uh, uh, mouse to rat chimeras, and these are the pancreas. So we prepared islets uh, from these uh, pancreas and transplanted to the uh, diabetic mice. And this uh, accesses the blood glucose levels and all of them, uh, because it's drug-induced uh, diabetic mice, they have very high uh, blood glucose levels initially. But after a transplantation of 100 islets, within 60 days, the uh, blood glucose levels were normalized. So it was very uh, effective. And uh, you know, even uh, over a year, we are able to maintain uh, normal blood glucose levels in those recipients. And when we took out the uh, graft by remove, removing one of the kidneys, then the blood glucose levels went up very high, indicating that those transplanted 100 islets are responsible for this <coughs> cure for the diabetes. And most importantly, uh, there were some uh, rat cells remaining in the graft, but they are completely removed because they are immunocompetent uh, recipients. And also, we didn't use any long-term immunosuppressant, uh, only for the first five days, uh, just to avoid acute uh, you know, uh, rejection. But after that, no uh, immunosuppression necessary, indicating uh, that you know these are truly uh, self uh, islets and no need uh, for immunosuppression. So this is indeed a proof of concept data for our ultimate goal, although it, it was done in rodents. So the conclusion here is uh, the exogenous in vivo environment uh, provided near normal uh, physiological uh, developmental cues with proper epigenetic change to form a truly functional organ. And also, uh, if it's a self uh, autologous uh, islet, we only need very small number of uh, islets for, to treat diabetes. Uh, 100 mouse islets is less than 2% of the islets that wild type mouse has. So uh, these two things we were able to learn. Now the question is, you know, obviously, rat and mouse, they're too small to provide human organs. So we have to uh, move uh, to uh, uh, larger animals. So uh, uh, as a host, potential host, we thought pigs and sheep uh, are good because they have similar organ size, physiology, and also anatomy uh, to humans. In addition, uh, these livestock animals, they grow very fast. Within a year, uh, they you know, become good enough, uh, large enough to provide uh, human organs. So uh, we <coughs> generated uh, by transgenic 
and also uh, somatic cell nuclear transfer technology, we generated a pancreatic uh, pigs, the pigs that cannot make a pancreas. And we injected uh, exogenous uh, uh, orange color labeled transgenic pig stem cells. We used a blast mare, so uh, kind of uh, ES like cells uh, to prove that uh, blastist complementation also works in uh, large animals like pigs. And indeed, it worked, and some of them grew into adulthood. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're entirely normal for, uh, you know, uh, pancreatic function, including uh, blood glucose levels. So at this point, uh, this was like 2013 that we published this, these data, uh, we are able to inject human iPS cells to the apancreatic uh, pancreatogenesis disabled uh, embryos. However, at that time, uh, implantation of human animal admix embryos uh, was prohibited by the guidelines in Japan. So although we have all the you know, uh, proof of concept data and also the materials to inject, uh, like apancreatic uh, pigs, uh, we're not able to test uh, or perform experiments. So that's why you know, I uh, moved to Stanford University uh, because here it is, it was possible, it is possible. And so we continue, we try to continue our study uh, here in the US. However, uh, after I moved to Stanford, NIH set restrictions on Chimera research. So they stopped funding uh, these uh, research. So it was right. a little disappointing. Now, Insu has a comment on this. That's right. Thank you so much. I just wanted to expand a little bit on this point. This is an important point about the American context. Um, back in September of 2015, the NIH put what's called the funding moratorium on certain kinds of stem cell based chimera research. So in particular here, they uh, don't allow the funding for research that involves the transfer of human pluripotent stem cells into non human vertebrate embryos that are at the pre-gastrulation stage, so pre-implantation embryos. And they really called out, for example, non-human primate blastocysts as a no-go zone for this. This moratorium is still in place today. Um, there's still no funding for the type of work at the NIH level for what Hiro would like to do. Um, they have, there has been a proposal to have a steering committee form that would provide advice to Francis Collins on a case-by-case -case basis for protocols, but to my knowledge, there is no such steering committee that has formed. I want to contrast this with England. In the UK, there's what's called the HFEA, the Human Fertilization Embryology Authority, which gives all licenses for human embryo research. And interestingly enough, they have a category that are called admixed embryo, defined as an animal non-human embryo that has human stem cells uh, put into it. And the HFEA governs that type of work only when the human contribution, quote unquote, predominates. It's not really clear what they mean by predominates. Is it a fractional percentage of human cells that predominates, or is it maybe where the cells migrate? Maybe they go to a particularly important region, like the central nervous system, and so the human contribution predominates in that sense. It's not very clear. But in the UK, at least there has been an attempt to try to deal with this type of research and put it under review, under their current system. But getting back to the NIH, it's very interesting because you have to know that there is no other moratorium on other forms of human and non-human mixing. So for example, there's no funding moratorium on the genetic humanization of mice and other lab animals. There's no funding moratorium on other very similar types of research. For example, the transfer of human glial progenitor cells into the neonatal brains of mice. Um, so one might ask, well, why is that? Uh, can you go to the next slide, please, Hiro? So uh, it appears that the overriding concern is a real unease about the um, process of biological humanization, biological humanization leading to a radical sort of moral humanization, that there's going to be an overlap between biological humanization and what we one might call moral humanization. And so what we have here in the photo is, you know, what maybe one sense of morally significant humanization would be appearance. 
Um, there have been actually some bioethicists that I'm aware of who've raised the concern that uh, it would be deeply troubling if uh, there were a sheep that had a human face, or in this case, a, a pig with a human-like face. I really think that concerns like that need a real science uh, reality check, because in order to get that kind of outcome, you would have to make chimeric modifications to all three germ layers, mesoderm, ectoderm, endoderm, and only limit that chimerization of all three germ layers just to the face. And I don't think that that's possible. I think you would have to do probably genome editing instead to get something like this. So, so I don't think it's actually possible to get these kinds of outcomes, but certainly the public and, and you know, others have quite an active imagination. And so that might be one concern. Um, what about pig with a human brain or non-human animal with a human-like brain? What's the concern there? The concern might be some human-like cognition. What about pigs with human germ cells, you know, sperm and eggs? Um, again, I think the idea there is that the concern that there could be an inadvertent fertilization event between a chimeric animal and non-chimeric animal, and you end up with a human-animal hybrid. Um, again, nobody wants that, and there are strict guidelines right now about not breeding chimeric animals that could have germ cell formation. Um, we are going to talk a little bit later in this presentation about specific strategies to avoid widespread uncontrolled, unwanted chimerism. So I'll save that for a little bit later, but I wanna leave you with one thought before I turn it back to Hero. Here's one thought I want you to think about. If moral humanization really means something like the appearance of uniquely human cognitive traits, uniquely human mental experiences, then I think that particular worry lies more in the area of science fiction than science possibility. Take for example, a 100% human brain in a newborn, 100% human. That newborn brain is not gonna have typical uh, human cognitive like traits or higher functioning if it doesn't also have interaction with society, interaction with caregivers, it doesn't learn a language, it doesn't actually get treated like a human being. So there is no um, inevitable property of human cells, I would say, that gets you uh, without any, any doubt, human cognition or human-like cognition. So with that thought, I wanna just leave it there and I wanna return now back to the science and I'll turn it back to Hiromitsu. Take it away. Okay, thanks. So uh, I was not able to get NIH funding, but luckily I had a funding from a CERN, a California Institute of Regenerative Medicine. Uh, they're more generous, so I was able to uh, continue uh, working on uh, this project. And uh, one of the first things I did is to create uh, a pancreatic uh, sheep because sheep study, sheep uh, uh, embryology is not available in Japan, but here at UC Davis, for example, they have experts on this. So we this time used uh, CRISPR technology to make straight PDX1 knockout. It worked. And uh, then we also started to uh, make human sheep uh, chimeric embryos. Uh, in this uh, photo, uh, we are injecting a TD tomato, which is the red color uh, labeling, uh, TD tomato labeled human iPS cells uh, into E5 uh, uh, sheep embryo. Of course, we have all the uh, approval from the Stanford University and also at UC Davis. Uh, so we, it took some time, but we uh, started to uh, do this kind of uh, uh, human, making human animal, human sheep kind of. And uh, 24 uh, hours later, uh, uh, in culture, we were able to see uh, human uh, iPS cells still there. And, uh, you know, well uh, mixed with the sheep cells looks like. And then uh, our collaborator, uh, Professor uh, Pablo Ross and his team is injecting these chimeric human sheep chimeric embryos into the uterus of the uh, ho uh, foster uh, sheep. This is the uh, uterus. Uh, uh, this is sheep, uh, surrogate sheep mother. And, and uh, oops. Uh, he's uh, injecting uh, these kind of embryos into the uh, uterus. And then uh, three weeks later, we uh, recovered 
all these uh, embryos. And in this case, uh, I think nine out of 20 uh, embryos, sheep hymenic embryos, uh, showed more than one human cell in uh, 100,000 uh, sheep cells. Uh, even uh, so, this is a very small number compared with the rat mouse uh, chimeras. So uh, somehow uh, the human uh, sheep uh, and also some other group has shown a human uh, pig chimera uh, is far more difficult to make uh, compared with rat mouse uh, chimeras that we have shown. So at this point, uh, our real challenge is uh, to overcome this uh, interspecies compatibility. Uh, we call it a uh, xenogenic barrier. Uh, human iPS cells minimally contributed to human sheep chimeras. And there must be some kind of barrier uh, to prevent uh, efficient uh, chimera formation. So we continue to, we go back to rodent studies and analyze carefully what happens to chimeric embryos after transfer. So uh, we uh, generated rat to mouse uh, chimera and followed uh, their fate uh, after transfer. So uh, this is the uh, chimerism of each embryo after uh, transplantation. So at E9.5, we see you know, many uh, embryos with high rat uh, chimerism. Uh, but at around E15, E11.5, all these embryos are gone. By E14.5, only a very uh, low chimeric uh, embryos are uh, surviving. This is in contrast to the mouse to mouse uh, chimeras, where at, even at E15.5, you know, uh, more than 25% uh, uh, chimeric, uh, most uh, embryos uh, have average. 25%. And we also tested uh, the embryonic survival rate. And in the case of rat ES cells to mouse, uh, rat to mouse uh, chimeras, uh, the uh, survi survival rate goes down very quickly after uh, e around E10. Uh, this is in contrast to the mouse to mouse chimeras, uh, more than uh, almost 80% of them survive even at E15.5. So clearly, interspecies chimeras have a problem, uh, particularly with a high degree of chimerism. They are prone to uh, greater incidence of uh, intrauterine death or some sort of malformation. To further confirm uh, this uh, idea of you know, genetic or evolutionary distance may be involved, uh, we uh, try to make uh, uh, chimeras between mouse and uh, prairie vole, or we call it vole mouse. Uh, they're uh, the, one of the most distant species within rodents from a mouse. So the uh, mouse rat is about uh, diverse about 25 million years ago, whereas uh, mouse and prairie vole, they are diverged about 44 million years. So we uh, generated uh, iPS cells from all mice, uh, two independent uh, lines, and then we injected them to mouse uh, brushes and see how they behave, you know, how they uh, make uh, chimeras. So two independent cell lines using two independent experiments. In both cases, uh, we do see uh, for uh, chimeras at uh, earlier stage, like E10.5, but E13.5, the number of chimeras decreases, as you can see. And at birth, the, the number further decreased to less than 3%. So uh, this is much less efficient than mouse uh, to rat, rat to mouse chimeras. So uh, chimera generation was uh, between mouse and whole mouse was possible, but much less efficient. So th these are the uh, mouse wall chimera, this is a wild type mouse. So a little weird looking uh, uh, chimeras, but they, they could survive. So uh, it appears that uh, 
the, this zero barrier is probably uh, the result as a result of uh, evolutionary distance, distance. So mouse rat is right here, uh, chicken quail, these uh, chimeras have been reported. Uh, and also we tested this mouse play ball, which is around here. So we are able to make chimeras relatively easily uh, if it's less than maybe 50 million years of divergence. But now we have to make chimeras between human pig, human sheep, human mouse. Uh, this is about more than you know, 90, 90 million years of uh, divergence. So this is a little difficult. Uh, to uh, to overcome. So uh, to further understand what happens if we use you know higher you know and you know evolutionary uh, more uh, up on top of the high, closer to a human being. So but obviously we cannot make human monkey chimeras. So we decided to test uh, what happens if we try to make uh, non-human primate, non-human primate chimeras. So mouse rat diverged about 24 million years ago. Uh, human and chimpanzee are much uh, closer, like only six million years of divergence uh, between these two species, so very close to human. Uh, so is, uh, the same is true for uh, rhesus macaque and pig-tailed macaque. They are you know, very close uh, in terms of uh, evolutionary distance. So we cannot use human, but we can use chimpanzee iPS cells. iPS cells, so you know, technology is so convenient, we can make uh, iPS cells from uh, very, uh, uh, <clears throat> various uh, species quite easily. So we obtain some uh, blood uh, uh, from the uh, chimpanzee, and then we established also other people established uh, chimpanzee iPS cells. So we use these chimpanzee iPS cells, and also uh, iPS cells from these different subspecies of macaque. We try to see how they behave when they uh, try to, uh, when we try to make chimeras among these uh, non-human primate species. The experiment is extremely difficult, uh, obviously. Uh, we can generate, uh, uh, iPS cells from pig-tailed macaque or chimpanzee, and we can label these cells with a TD tomato, and uh, we transfected uh, BCL2. This is the anti-apoptotic gene, and this, we know from our rodent studies that BCL2 expression helps to increase the chimerism or survival of the injected uh, iPS cells. And then uh, we injected these uh, cells into the macaque uh, embryos. Uh, this is in collaboration with a scientist at UC Davis. And we cultured for 48 hours and see how they behave. Uh, the culture of these uh, non-human primate embryos is very difficult and uh, is not easy to maintain them in culture for more than 48 hours. So we analyze it in this uh, you know, preliminary experiment. Uh, we analyze the uh, 48 hours after the initiation of culture. And uh, we have you know, different experiments, but here we try to see how they behave. Uh, they mean human, human, or human chimp, uh, you know, co culture. And then uh, they developed into uh, muscle cells. And these human, human, human chimp, they're both, uh, you know, uh, differentiated well and uh, cooperated functionally well. So, human and chimp, although there's some difference in the culture conditions, but they behave very uh, in a very similar manner. So we're, again, we're very close. Uh, however, if we co-culture mouse, mouse, uh, a mouse, human, uh, unlike mouse, mouse, the mouse, human, they do not integrate very well. As you can see, they grow independently. They do not, they, they tend not to mix uh, together. Uh, we also uh, <coughs> analyze the uh, you know, chimerism uh, 48 hours uh, between these uh, NHP, NHP uh, chimeras. As you can see, uh, you know, it's much better than uh, mouse brain bone, uh, mouse rat uh, uh, chimeras. 
So in some cases, more than 90% of them showed uh, chymase, particularly with the help of BCL2. So they do well, uh, at least in this very short term culture period. Uh, but we have to, of course, uh, see, observe much longer, but, uh, but there are some technical difficulties. And hopefully we're able to transfer these back to the uh, foster uh, mother uh, to do in vivo uh, experiment. So anyway, uh, the, these uh, interesting uh, and important uh, findings uh, for our future uh, potential uh, work to overcome xenogenic barrier. So meanwhile, uh, it, it almost took 10 years to revise the guideline, but finally, uh, Japanese government uh, lifted the ban on human animal chimera research. Um, so uh, we, over the years, we discussed, I discussed with many people uh, and uh, it appears that, you know, by this time, uh, <clears throat> this was like two years ago, uh, we, they, we know that, you know, human animal chimera is not easy to make. So they, uh, I think they do not, they realize that it's not uh, necessary to worry too much about the humanization uh, of the uh, pig or sheep or any animals when we make human animal chimeras. So uh, now uh, I got formal approval to do uh, human animal chimera research uh, last year. And we started to uh, the uh, injection of human iPS cells uh, into uh, uh, pigs and rat and, and mouse and so on. But also, meanwhile, uh, my collaborators uh, also uh, generated a number of uh, a, uh, organogenesis disabled pigs, uh, not just pancreas, also kidneys, uh, blood and vessels, liver, and even the double knockout, uh, mean, meaning uh, all the pancreas, blood and vessels are lacking. So we should be able to, if it works, make uh, human pancreas, uh, also the blood and vessels are from IPS, the human uh, derived. And uh, we're starting uh, injection of uh, IPS, uh, human IPS cells in pig embryos. And in some cases we see good integration of human cells into the pig cells. But eventually uh, they lose uh, their contribution. So we still need to uh, overcome uh, we need to understand, manipulate this uh, xenogenic barrier between human and uh, pig. Uh, uh, so, so in order to, you know, over the years, I, I realized that, uh, as Insu mentioned, many people are uh, concerned uh, about the uh, generation of uh, animal with a human uh, brain cells or germ cells uh, to avoid, you know, but it, it is very difficult to define what percentage of uh, human cells present in animal brain is okay. And it's very difficult. Uh, so uh, one idea uh, that we have is to completely, uh, to make an iPS cell lines that cannot uh, at all uh, com contribute to uh, human forebrain or germ cells. So just to test this idea, we knocked out OTX2 and PL PLDN14. These genes are important for the generation of brain and also germ cells. But we, when we try to make pancreas, uh, these cells uh, were able to make pancreas, uh, functional pancreas, but uh, we didn't see any uh, contribution of iPSC derived cells in these chimeras. So essentially, if we use this, uh, similar to this uh, double knockout IPS line, human, then uh, we do not need to worry about uh, generation of, uh, you know, somewhat ambiguous uh, animals, pigs with human uh, brain or human germ cells. So this is one approach to minimize, <laughs> to reduce the people's ethical and social concern. Concern. So uh, we are planning to use this kind of uh, iPS cells uh, 
for our future research in human animal kindness. So uh, I think Insu has a comment on, on this. Sure, thank you. Um, so I want to just address a little bit of what we know or don't know about public attitudes regarding this type of research. So I mentioned that the NIH had the moratorium, they still have the moratorium in place. Right around the time that they proposed this idea of a steering committee, they had a uh, public comment period where people could you know, go to the website and enter their, their thoughts or their ideas or comments in a uh, online portal. Um, and they got thousands of responses. Now, I don't really know how informative that is in getting a, a sense of what public attitudes are because uh, in many, many cases, thousands of these cases, you had essentially the same comment uh, cut and pasted onto the, the comment field. So we're not really sure you know, how representative that is of actual individuals. Um, and a lot of the comments had to do very broadly with things about, you know, um, you shouldn't be playing God, or this is this uh, stem cell research in general, or embryo research in general is wrong. Nothing really specifically addressing um, this type of research itself. So the NIH comment period, I personally think, is not very informative for a, a gauge on where social uh, views are. There was this paper that we have up here on the screen um, that was published recently by a group. And uh, what they claimed was that um, about 59% of the American public can personally accept pig organ chimeras. Now, what's interesting about this article is that if you look at the title, it's not specific to um, human you know, pig organ chimeras. Uh, it seems to speak more to just in general human animal, animal chimera research. Um, so this was called out actually by a few colleagues, some of my colleagues at the Hastings Center. They, they, they criticized this article for being not representative in terms of the sample used with respect to the age of the respondents, the geography and the gender. Um, didn't address what other types of chimeras and besides the pig organ chimeras. So, uh, so I think those are, those are uh, pretty legitimate concerns that are about this paper. Now the authors did respond. They did respond by saying that they acknowledged these limitations in the paper itself that's what they claimed, and that they wanted really just to get a general sense of public attitudes about this kind of research. Um, so I think there's a lot more work to do in understanding public attitudes. Um, you know, the authors of this study claim that the public attitudes had greater acceptance in Japan for this type of work. Um, but I think this calls for a need for more, uh, more information about public attitudes and what to do with that. Next slide, please. So where are we right now with the International Society guidelines? We're in the middle of revising them. I can really just speak to the current uh, version that's live now, which is the 2016 version. I will say that in the absence of any kind of real hard data on where the public sits on this topic, both in the US and out of the US, uh, we had to pretty much proceed as, as we did uh, back in 2016 of just really focusing mainly on animal welfare. Um, as Hiro had pointed out, and if I've tried to point out, the level of chimerism we're actually seeing in animal models with human cells is really pretty low. This is quite challenging to get widespread chimerism of the type that people are afraid of. Um, so where we've really settled for quite a while now is in the guidelines attending to issues around animal welfare of modified animals. I think it's a supreme arrogance to think that once you um, transfer human cells, especially human brain cells into animals that somehow you're going to enhance them and you, you're gonna make them better, right? But the reality is if anything, modified animals have a radical uh, you know, lowering of their animal welfare and disequilibrium and other deficits. So we really wanted researchers and regulators to be attentive to that. Um, but this is an ongoing issue. As I said, we're, we're currently revising these guidelines and we do have to pay particular attention to the type of experiments that Hiro and his colleagues and others are pursuing. We have to attend to chimeric embryo work, which really was not um, addressed in the previous guidelines. And uh, the work with non-human primates and livestock animals, there actually has to be quite a bit of additional guidance for investigators about how to work with these animals and to meet their unique needs. Um, so. Look forward to the guidelines that are, we hope, going to come out sometime in April, sometime in the spring. And uh, there's plenty more to talk about. Let me turn it back over to Hiro. Go ahead. OK, uh, so, so to wrap up my talk, as a conclusion too, uh, so uh, xenogenic system, uh, iPS cells contribute to uh, chimeras much less efficiency. So there's a xeno barrier. And so what, are, what is the mechanism of this 
Uh, there could be a number of reasons, but mostly dependent on the evolutionary uh, divergence or evolutionary distance between two species. This, these could be differences in ligand receptor uh, interactions. They may have lower affinity, for example. Uh, this could be, uh, cell, there could be uh, cell intrinsic aspects such as doubling time, differentiation rate, and so on. And also uh, there may be some dif uh, affinity differences in adhesion molecules between two different species. Uh, there may be also an involvement of innate or acquired immunity to prevent uh, generation of, uh, uh, you know, uh, interspecies chimeras. So, uh, in conclusion, uh, I think we need to understand and manipulate better uh, the Zeno barrier. And this is the key to the generation of human organs in live stock animals. So our future direction is of course, we need to overcome the Zeno barrier that exists between uh, human and animals. Uh, I, I think it's also important to you know, keep good balance between medical needs and social consensus. Uh, so we try to keep uh, the transparency of our research. And uh, also we try to uh, gain understanding of research content and medical uh, usefulness. Of this type of research. Uh, also, once we succeed it, uh, we need to provide uh, safety uh, by excluding uh, possibility of uh, infection or tumor development and so on. So that's uh, you know all about what I want to say. And these are the names of the people who contributed to this project and also the funding agencies. So I stop here and uh, I get, you know, uh, get back to uh, uh, insert. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So we've had some questions come in. Um, and so while I'm, I'm, I'm going through those, let me start with a question that's come in by um, Bob Trug. And it's actually the same question I had. Um, you know, as you may know, the church lab here at Harvard Medical School is interested in genetically modifying pig organs to make them compatible with humans for transplantation. Can you speak to that strategy? How, what are your thoughts on that? And, and um, are there advantages or disadvantages as compared to the strategy that you're pursuing? Yeah, that's a very uh, good question, I think. Uh, actually, I was trained as an immunologist. Uh, I may be a dropout immunologist, but I still think that you know, immune system is very precise. And it's not just the major histocompatibility complex, MHC or HLA, that determines the uh, you know, self or non-self. So I think their approach, uh, humanizing uh, uh, pigs to avoid uh, immunological rejection is fine for some organs like liver because they, liver is tolerable uh, relatively. But I think eventually, even liver will be rejected and uh, probably patient has to have, uh, you know, immunosuppression for a lifetime, I guess. So it, it could be, could provide a good uh, bridging therapy until the donor organ becomes available. But eventually I think it's, it's not an ideal situation. It's okay, uh, it's, it's, it's needed, uh, but it's, it's not an uh, absolute uh, you know, answer to this problem. Whereas in my case, it's a little different. Uh, so we are making human organs in pigs. So in this case, we have to worry about rejection by the pig, including xeno barrier. But once, you know, generated, this organ is autologous. So it should provide, uh, you know, more or less a complete cure for the uh, patient. So that right. makes difference. Thank you. So as an immunologist, let me just ask you one of the questions I had. How confident are you actually that um, after all the manipulations and growing in the, in the pig model, for example, a human patient-derived iPS cell organ will actually be compatible? Um, um, what, are there any concerns about like surface markers changing or anything like that, that, that will make it a little bit more foreign <laughs> to, the, to the person from which the iPS cells came from? Yeah. So... Uh... You know, once generated, it should be okay. But you know, of course, those uh, organ uh, organs generated in pigs should have some pig cells, uh, you know, sort of coexisting or contaminating. But as I showed you in the rat mouse experiments, 
you know, we are transplanting these into the immunocompetent recipients. It may, you know, we may need to do some immunosuppression initially, but you know, uh, since they're immunocompetent, eventually they will eliminate all the pig cells. Uh, you know, so eventually they will, uh, the patient will not require any immunosuppression. Yeah, that is my hope <laughs> that uh, the, you know, the data from the rodent studies. A few more technical questions have come in. I mean, let me just uh, get these to you first, and then I think I'll address some of the ethical questions that maybe you and I could speak to. But another technical question, kind of along these lines, is um, how do you actually get all the cell types you need in, let's say, a, a, you know, a pancreas or or a kidney um, that's not going to have pig contribution? I mean, you know, some I, I assume that there are other germ lineages involved, right? So if you do your knockout animal and then you, and then you rescue it with the human derived cells doesn't that pretty much follow just one germ lineage how, how do you get all the cell types you need yeah so um, pancreas is a relatively simple organ you know uh, developmentally so if we knock out pdx1 all the pancreatic cells are in deficient so we are able to replace it with the ips cell derived cells but of course you know best cells hematopoietic cells or fibroblasts uh, there are many serotypes still. Uh, they are not under the influence of uh, PDX1. So that's why you know, we made a double knockout mice, I mean pigs first, uh, where you know, best cells, blood, and pancreas are all uh, deficient. So you know, at least uh, making you know, several combination knockouts, we should be able to replace most of it. May not be all, but as I said, eventually, uh, it was transplanted, you know, human cells will somehow replace, eliminate pig cells and replace by his own. That's my uh, optimistic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we saw also recently just published, uh, we uh, found another approach to do organogenesis uh, in, uh, in a xenogenic system. So this is a little different from uh, blastus complementation. And this system may provide even better uh, replacement uh, of the human organs, tissues, and cells. So, you know, technology is developing. Uh, hopefully, we can provide better <laughs> for complete uh, human transplantable organs. Right. A really nice question came in. I think this is really for both of us. Um, other than the humanization or the moral humanization concerns about this type of work, do you see other ethical issues, ethical concerns about growing human organs in animals? Well, of course, uh, the second most uh, common uh, criticism is uh, animal welfare. You know, how you can kill pigs just to generate human organs. But, you know, for this, uh, you know, I can argue that, you know, as I said, every day, uh, 20 people die waiting for uh, donor organs. So if, ideally, if we sacrifice 20 pigs, <laughs> if it works, uh, then we can save those people. And just think about how many pigs we are sacrificing for our, as for the food. Uh, this is almost negligible number of uh, pigs. And I think, you know, from the uh, medical uh, viewpoint, I think uh, there's, this is this approach is I think uh, rational. I mean, mm -hmm. we can we can you know. Uh, argue against that kind of, uh, you know, criticism. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I must say from my own point of view, um, there's an important distinction between the, the use of livestock animals for food and, and those for uh, medical purposes such as this. This may not change anybody's mind, but I want to just point out this distinction and that is, uh, suppose in a world where we have these human organ chimeras for medical therapies, um, they're actually going to be treated as medical products. Um, you, you, I, I would, I would think that the um, housing and the care and even the, the euthanasia of these animals would be more along the lines of like a non-survival surgery and, um, and pretty, pretty, I wouldn't, it's not free range, but a pretty um, more comfortable environment than uh, factory farming or some of the much more horrific scenarios that, that people are well aware of that happens in the, in the, you know, um, the food industry. So um, one might not maybe imagine or have a clear picture of exactly what that uh, 
facility might look like, but uh, that's actually some of the issues that we're touching on in, on our guidelines. We're, we're thinking about, you know, what recommendations do we have for housing and care of these animals, even if they're just used at the research phase. Um, you don't want to com uh, complicate your research results by having stressed out animals and having, you know, a, a, unsafe work environments for staff and for uh, for the animals themselves. So uh, I don't know if that's going to change anybody's minds, but you really have to realize that I think the conditions for raising organ chimeras are going to be quite different. Um, like I said, it's going to be a non-survival surgery um, for organ retrieval. Um, and, you know, um, maybe that might matter for some people uh, thinking about those differences. Okay. Um, Someone asked, did you ever, did you inject mouse ESLs into monkey embryos? What, what type of, what other type of cells did you put into monkey embryos? And did the mouse, did mouse ESLs, does that work? Or did you just stick to um, yeah, the uh, I, I think we have done that experiment because we can do it without any approval. Uh, so, uh, but I think it didn't work. I don't remember precisely, but, uh, uh, because we, the reason why we performed that is we know that mouse ES cells are truly uh, naive or chimera forming uh, ES cells. So we wanted to see if it works in, in uh, monkeys or some other species, uh, but uh, I don't think it worked well. <laughs> so we tried, but it didn't work. But we didn't, uh, you know, do, we didn't spend so much time on that because now we're working on human IPS cells. Yeah. yeah, and somebody else asked, um, even if this technology is feasible, would you be able to grow an organ quickly enough to help a patient? Yeah, as I said, you know, the, these livestock animals have been improved and uh, they grow very fast. Uh, within 10 months, they become over 100 kilos. So uh, we have, I think we have, depending on the you know situation, but uh, uh, for those with, uh, uh, for example, heart or kidneys, we have, we have you know, uh, artificial organs to support their life for, for a while. So depending on the organs, but we, we, we think we can, if it works, we should be able to prepare organs within 10 months or so. So mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. quite fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I think where some of the um, attendees are really quite fascinated in thinking about is uh, the, the possibility that you can actually, once you are able to gen generate organs in this fashion, that there could be other, other social problems sort of um, that arise. So one issue might be, you know, currently in our very constrained way, we try to have an organ, you know, a transplantation waiting list, and there's no, you know, money involved. But if you're able, actually able to grow organs in, in, a, in the kind of like in the commercial environment, right? Uh, do we need to have, and have you thought about any idea of like what, what selection would look like and how you could actually fairly, you know, get organs into people who maybe on, on the current waiting list uh, are ranked very high, but maybe because they don't, they can't, you know, have access to researchers who will, can use their IPS cells or something like that, that they actually, the priorities get a little bit messed up. So do you know what distribution would look like under this kind of, uh, this, this future? And have you thought about any of that? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. Uh, you know, first of all, I should, as I mentioned, you know, there's a black market. You know, actually 10% of transplantation performed worldwide uh, are using, uh, you know, those uh, organs from black market. It's clearly, you know, for the rich people, I would say, and even after, even even though even after transplantation, they have to uh, have uh, immunosuppression throughout their life. It's a lifelong you know immunosuppression, uh, which is very costly too. So it's it's a very expensive uh, you know treatment at the moment, and people might think you know pigs using pigs is expensive, but uh, actually it's not. You know, uh, pig costs only. 300, 400 dollars, uh, because you know we, you know, sacrifice many, many pigs, billions of pigs uh, for food. So once you know we establish the system, uh, the cost should be much cheaper overall uh, compared with the current, uh, you know, uh, artificial, uh, you know, organs and uh, immunosuppression. So uh, yeah, uh, so once uh, then. So that means uh, probably initially we have to uh, think about how we triage the patients. But uh, once the system is established, it should provide relatively inexpensive uh, way. Uh, so uh, 
yeah, only for the initial maybe three, four years, <laughs> we may have to triage uh, patients. But, uh, you know, as I said, they grow very fast. So we should be able to you know, help many patients uh, relatively in a short time. And not worrying about the, uh, you know, price uh, cost involved. Right. So, uh, so your work focuses on the transfer of human cells and, and trying to develop, and tr try to trying to fill in the the, the missing organ of interest. Um, but obviously, you also have to work equally hard, maybe with another group, in developing these organogenesis disabled animals. And I've noticed that um, in your slides that you, you've. You've had uh, pancreas disabled, and you've had various other organs, but I, I didn't see heart disabled. Is that a particularly challenging one? You know, because your other slides show that the, in, in, the, in the concept phase, <laughs> it was all hearts, right? And I think people are kind of like really fascinated with heart transplant. Maybe it's because of the, uh, the cultural baggage around hearts, but, um, but yeah, how, how difficult is, is making these organogenesis disabled animals and who's working on that? And that has to, I'm sure, have to go in parallel with uh, the work you're focused on. Uh, interestingly, you know, for example, in the US, uh, the cardiology is very well advanced. Many good uh, cardiac uh, cardiologists, uh, cardiac surgeons here. Uh, however, the basic science of heart development is not that advanced, I would say, compared with, uh, you know, organs like a pancreas, a kidneys, a liver. Uh, I think it's a little more you know, complex, the development of a heart, heart is. So we may have to knock out, uh, probably because heart is a very important fundamental organ. You know, uh, it starts, development starts early and involves, involves several different uh, uh, transcription factors. And we still need to know much more about uh, development of heart and uh, molecular terms. So that's why, although I'm very, very much interested in generations of heart uh, using this approach, but uh, uh, we still need some more uh, basic science uh, to do this. Yeah, so this next question might be a little bit tricky to for you to answer just in principle, but do you see any undesired co-effects or unpredictable uh, unpredictable effects in the process that you're pursuing? Well, that's, a, that's what you know, I'm constantly thinking about. Uh, yeah. I mostly, uh, I don't concern much about you know, human-like uh, pigs, but uh, as in the COVID-19, you know, I worry about you know, uh, zoosis, some you know, viral, uh, new virus uh, coming out of this type of uh, you know, human-animal chimeras. So that's one thing I worry about. But this is, you know, uh, I think Joe Church's group's contribution. Uh, now we can screen, sequence whole genome pigs and look for any potential, you know, uh, viral-like, you know, uh, sequences and we can knock it out. So, uh, you know, we may have some, uh, you know, uh, potential initially, but once this system start to work, I focus my all my attention to the safety of uh, uh, this type of uh, therapy. Mm -hmm. and, and technically, I think it's possible. Yeah, have you given, here's another question. Have you given some thought to um, the patenting that underlies these technologies and whether some of that could become a barrier to uh, people's access later? Uh, I have some patents, uh, basic patents on this, uh, but uh, you know, the patent has different meanings. I, you know, it makes me rich for free, but you know, that's not the the only purpose. You know, it, I can also prevent other people, uh, you know, use this technology and make money. So as long as, as long as I have the patent, I can control. You know, I can avoid, you know, unnecessary uh, cap capitalistic involvement in this uh, kind of uh, treatment. So I, I'm, uh, I'm hoping that you know. I don't, it doesn't need to be my group, but somebody uh, will uh, contribute to the work and hopefully provide this form of uh, therapy uh, with uh, minimum cost. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know this uh, medical cost is extremely high in this country. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't want to add to that. So uh, yeah, that's my, my idea.
So you said that recently the Japanese government uh, changed their their regulations around this type of work. Um, do you think do you find that attitudes are different in Japan around this work than in the U.S. As far as you can tell, what, what's your feeling on kind of any cultural differences, anything like that? Well, over the years, almost ten years, you know, my work, our research has been, you know, uh, published, and also, you know, the media. Uh, newspapers, TVs, they also, you know, uh, talk about or uh, broadcast it or uh, talk about our research. So people realized, you know, initially it was a kind of a shocking uh, research for them, but now they realize what's going on. I try to, you know, maintain uh, the transparency of our research also and keep telling them what we are trying to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I, I think I got better understanding of the, of the people about what we are doing. And also uh, the government has realized uh, that, you know, uh, human animal chimera is not like making a monster <laughs> and uh, a high contribution of human cells is not so, uh, you know, easy. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, so those are the things uh, the government has changed uh, their attitude. Also, people have also got yeah. a little better understanding of what we are trying to do. Yeah, so you've been at it for quite a while now. Uh, what do you think is the, the factor or factors that, that have really contributed to, to the slower pace of what you're hoping to do? Is it funding issues? Is it, are there scientific technical barriers? What are kind of like, like the biggest reasons why um, you know, the, work, the work is taking a while? <laughs> you know, uh, Japan, is uh, based on the bureaucratic system. Uh, so uh, the officials or bureaucrats, they want to avoid any uh, bad marks, <laughs> disclaimer. Uh, so and this 100% uh, you know, disclaimer uh, is uh, possible. They do not want to change uh, the current situation. Very conservative. Uh, so I think that's the basic Reason. And once they realize that some other uh, you know, scientists have made human animal chimeras and almost no contribution of human cells, uh, I think then they uh, thought you know, it's, it's okay, it's safe uh, to change the guidelines. So they're, they're not interested in uh, introducing new uh, treatments or new technologies. They just want to be conservative, not to be blamed. <laughs> Yeah, that is a general attitude of uh, Japanese, uh, you know, bureaucrats. So, since coming to the United States and, and working under CERM funding, um, do you find that CERM funding? This, this is the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. This is state bond money that's devoted to stem cell and regenerative uh, medicine. Uh, just for the audience to know. So, you get CERM funding. Do you find that that is a pretty good substitute for NIH funding, or is there anything you kind of you know wish? Uh, any reason that you might want to wish for the moratorium at the NIH to be over and that you can apply for NIH funding? Uh, I think, you know, from my experience, uh, some funding is, uh, I would say, better overall because they're more generous, faster, and uh, uh, for the, they don't require too many <laughs> things. Uh, and I'm not very much fond of uh, NIH review system, uh, you know, if I depend totally on NIH grant, I cannot do any innovative research because NIH grant pro proposal requires almost done, you know, <laughs> a very incremental uh, sort of uh, project. Uh, so, uh, so, and also uh, recently, uh, the, the money, use of the money, uh, grant money is very much uh, restricted to the purpose of the uh, proposal. So we cannot do you know, any uh, trials or just, uh, uh, how can I say, I, I cannot use this money to do anything else. <laughs> uh, I cannot do uh, any innovative or just challenging experiments uh, if I solely dependent on NIH grant. Whereas some is more flexible, I hope, <laughs> and they take more challenging uh, proposals. So that, that's something I like. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So I noticed that your work 
primarily uses pig models. What about sheep? So um, are there, do you think there will be advantages to using sheep at one stage of research and then pigs at another? Um, I'm curious about why, you know, sometimes in your graphics you show both sheep and pigs, and we, and we actually do talk at the ISSCR about the use of both animal models. Why did you uh, gravitate toward pig use? Well, I didn't, you know, talk much about it, but, you know, from our experience, uh, this xenogenic barrier uh, is, you know, also uh, they show variation uh, organ to organ. So, uh, uh, in other words, uh, mouse rat chimeras, uh, when rat cells is injected into mouse process, or even between mouse, say, uh, in mouse and rat, uh, somehow, interesting, uh, if we make chimera, uh, for example, the rat cells tend to be mouse dominant. Uh, whereas uh, lungs or some other, you know, organs, uh, rat cells tend to become dominant. So uh, there's uh, some, you know, uh, organs, probably some organ specific uh, cytokines or some developmental cues uh, involved in this xenogenic chimera. So unless we try different uh, combination of uh, species, it's hard to tell, uh, you know, which one gives, you know, makes better, uh, human organ. So if possible, I'd like to try many different uh, species, but you know, sheep and uh, pigs are the, probably the only uh, reasonable <laughs> animals to try mm -hmm. because it requires a certain level of uh, uh, embryogenesis technology. And uh, those technologies are not available besides pig and sheep uh, in a reasonable level. Uh, so that's that's why. So I think it's uh, you know it's worth trying sheep as well, uh, not just pigs. Yeah. So you maintain two labs, right? Um, do they do different work? What? Um, well, why do you have two? Yeah. Well, uh, mm, <laughs> that's an interesting question. Yeah, we work together, and uh, yeah, we have the same ultimate goal. Uh, that is to make uh, organs, human organs in uh, livestock. Uh, but, you know, we have different technologies. And so, you know, although every week we have a meeting and discuss the progress, but, uh, you know, of course we have different projects uh, in depending on the laboratories, uh, but we work together and try to avoid uh, overlap and try to help each other. So that's mm -hmm. how it works. Do, um, do you ever have conversations with your lab members and your postdocs about career development? I mean, I, I, I would think that some people may be a little concerned in your lab about, um, you know, if, if there is ever sort of bad press around this kind of research or, or, or public, public disapproval that um, their, their career trajectories could suffer a bit. I mean, do you ever talk to them about, you know, these other concerns about, you know, um, they're starting off in their science of the career, they're part of your lab. And this is, for some people, very controversial research. I was curious about how that mentoring goes. Well, I don't think, you know, uh, they have, they worry about it, much about it. And, and uh, I think they understand that, you know, this is like a, a what do you call it, moonshot experiment? You know, <laughs> very challenging experiment. Yeah. I don't think any uh, postdoc, postdocs or graduate students can achieve this. In, three or four years. So it's a you know, long range uh, project. Uh, so, uh, you know, however, the, although, you know, students, postdocs are working on this project, they can always find some interesting, uh, you know, findings, discoveries. So people are publishing, as you know, we, we publish many papers. Uh, we haven't succeeded in making a human organs and pigs yet, but, mm -hmm. you know, on the way, uh, just like Apollo 11 uh, project, we have, you know, uh, inter internet or GPS, many, you know, byproducts from this, uh, uh, you know, long shot, uh, big, you know, project. So uh, I think they're enjoying it, you know, uh, rather enjoying it. Uh, so we, including myself, uh, do not worry about those, those things. We may be too optimistic, <laughs> but... Uh, no. Uh, they, are, they are publishing good papers and getting yeah. good, uh, you know, uh, positions. So uh, I don't think it's really a 
big uh, issue here in my lab. Yeah, I'm curious. Uh, so when you get your articles peer reviewed, your manuscripts peer reviewed, what generally do the reviewers say? I mean, as full disclosure, I've never reviewed any of your work at the manuscript phase. Uh, sometimes I get asked to do bioethics reviews. I was wondering, do you ever get bioethics reviews or what do some of the reviewers typically like focus on? I'm curious about that. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting uh, question. So uh, maybe seven, eight years ago, uh, even our first cell paper, uh, I think the editors uh, uh, somewhat skeptical about what we're doing. <laughs> and uh, uh, to tell you the truth, I wasn't trained as a developmental biologist. So I think I've made uh, uh, you know, some uh, wordings or terminologies uh, for the developmental biologists. So I was so naive. So they corrected some of our use of our language <laughs> terminologies. Uh, I, mean, I mean the reviewers. The editors, they were somewhat skeptical and some editors were, uh, you know, worry about the, uh, you know, virus issues <laughs> or, or this cannot be accepted socially or ethically. That kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, reviews or comments I used to get. But these days, you know, making Chimera is much better understood. And so uh, I don't get any of those ethical or social uh, comments, at least by the editors, scientific editors and the reviewers. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. <laughs> it took 10 years though. <laughs> okay, um, so I think I have time for one more question. And this comes again from Bob Trug. And, and this is a really nice segue to, by the way, for the audience, our next presentation next month. But um, could you comment on the greater urgency of this type of work for Japan, where their brain death is a little bit more controversial and organs from brain dead donors are much more limited? Is there? Is, do you see kind of a, a special a special connection or interest there in Japan for these kinds of reasons? Yeah, again, you know, uh, uh, the culture, the society in Japan is a little different from, uh, you know, Western, uh, maybe US or uh, you know, European countries. So uh, we still uh, do not uh, believe in uh, brain death, <laughs> but now it's, it's okay, getting better. There's still very limited number of uh, uh, transplantation uh, based on brain death. Uh, organs. So, uh, yeah, uh, I think, you know, uh, this is one issue, but also uh, medical economy is a big thing uh, because we have uh, more than uh, 300,000 uh, patients on hemodialysis, which is very expensive. And in, the, in Japan, everything is under uh, national insurance. And this really uh, becoming an uh, issue for the uh, medical uh, economy uh, viewpoint. So uh, I think there's a big demand uh, to, to generate, uh, you know, transplantable kidneys, for example. And mm -hmm. now the same is true. We have some, <laughs> Japan has technology to make good artificial kidneys, or at least the artificial heart. So the many uh, number of patients on uh, artificial heart is increasing dramatically. And this is very, very expensive, much more ex expensive than hemo uh, hemodialysis. And they, their life expectancy is like two or three years. So mm -hmm. for those patients, uh, real stress. Uh, so uh, yeah, there's a you know, demand uh, to provide uh, uh, donor organs for those patients in Japan. Well, thank you so much. I think I'm going to conclude with that then. Uh, so I, I thank you for sharing your time and your expertise with us. Um, for the audience, I want to also announce that we have another session on March 26th, Friday, with Nenad Sestan from the Yale School of Medicine. Uh, and you'll see, if you go to that talk, uh, how connected it is to what we just finished with here. I'd like to thank Ashley Troutman and Angela Alberti for all the logistics for this series. And I'd like to thank you, our audience, for joining us. I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Bye.